Welcome back, Zero K fans, to Nanalay the Zedon. I'm your host, or I mean your host, Shadow Fury333, and let's continue the stream with a match between Dimefriend and Hokomoko on Isle of Grief. So, Isle of Grief, a bit of a StarCrafty map. You start with the cliffs in the center, and then everything goes out from there. Though, despite the shape of the map, you don't often see a lot of gunship or air starts. You do see them, just not all the time. We have Shield for Hokomoko versus Clokibot for Dinefriend. Dinefriend going for a quick couple glaives. Actually, wait. Is Dinefriend? No, that's not infinite build. Okay, so a couple glaives, probably a worker. Hokomoko going for very early convicts into bandits. Loads and loads of bandits, and Dinefriend now regretting their choice of their factory. Probably figured they should have gone for gunships or something. Not that this is actually a bad choice for this map. Clokibot's generally a good choice. But, yeah. I can kind of see how my might be a little bit of a thing. Anyhow, Hokomoko is just setting up, getting their northeast set up. I mean, main base with a worker and northeast with a commander. Makes a lot of sense. Assuming, of course, that Dimefront is not going for the gunship plant. Now, on the other hand, Dimefront... I mean, they're relatively safe. The commanders in the main base. No defenders, though, so they don't suspect anything from gunship plan. No blastwing rushes or anything. Those things still exist. I mean, they still have a purpose. They still do stuff. They still burn things. Fire remains hot. Anyhow, Ho Dimefriend looks to be much more focused on making sure that Hokomoko can't get out of areas rather than trying to figure out what Hokomoko's doing inside of their base. Which makes sense, this map does have this two major lanes outside of the main base. If you protect only one, or you go to the main base, you might miss stuff coming out the other side, especially the watery side, which can be a little bit harder. I mean, harder to deal with. Whereas with Dinefront right now, they're not focused on this at all. In fact, they don't even know that Hokomoko is approaching along this eastern side, or I don't think they do. No radar, nope, they have no idea. None coming up either. Some urchins going down here, which... I'm curious if that'll work. I've never actually tried urchin in the shallows. I don't know if that would actually work. It might. Bandit looks... Yeah, it's trapped. That bandit is a dead bandit, and Hokomoko does not manage to get it out of there. What is time for... Oh, time for going for a machine gun. So yeah, urchin to protect this. I really want to see if this actually hits the bandits. I feel like it might, but at the same time, that's really a question of whether or not the torpedoes have a ta target category of any kind, or if it's just, I can hit them, they're underwater. It's probably, I can hit them, they're underwater. That's generally how Zero-K works. I'd be very surprised if it didn't work that way. Okamoko going, actually, a bit behind. Not very much, but very slightly behind. Dimefriend hasn't managed to harass much, but Dimefriend is being a little bit more aggressive in the construction. However... Actually, what am I saying? Hok Hokomoko going for the center expansion here. That's... that's aggressive. Dimefriend getting up a bit of energy. They're a bit behind on the energy. That's the thing here. Neither player really harassing. A couple of warriors coming up here, so Dimefriend possibly setting up for being attacked. But yeah, neither player has been really harassing all that much. Dimefriend... They're... They've got these slaves in the center that have just been hanging out there. Hokomoko with a nice little... There's a bandit posted here. It's always good to have. You now just have one staked out, figure out what's going on. Make sure the expansions aren't taken without you knowing. Mind you, the western expansion has not been staked out, while the eastern expansion in the center is being taken. So Hokomoko right now... Let's see... No, it looks like they're... Oh, it might actually work! It really depends on the position of these bandits, but these glaives... Two to one can beat a bandit. And, of course, they regenerate their health. So, overall, with attrition, Dimefriend might be able to win this. And, no, Dimefriend's about to lose one of their glaives! Get out of their glaive! Wait for at least three seconds. And that's what the warrior's for. Force the bandits out of the way and let the glaives actually come back to heal up. And, well... There was a bandit staked out there. It's no longer staked out there. That's the end of the bandit. Apart from that, though, well, relatively standard build up here from Dimefront. And Hokomoko just going for more bandits. No shield ball or anything. Okay, never, never mind, never mind. There's the thug. Thugs and outlaws. Shield ball is being built up pretty much on schedule. I mean, now that the, obviously the warrior is here, that kind of prevents everything. 
I mean, the bandits can only go so far at this point. And the bandits actually going near, near the warrior? Where is, what the, why are you going near where the warrior is? That's not where you want to go. I mean, I guess they figured there's going to be something built up there. They're not wrong. But the warrior's right there. Hasn't moved. I mean, if they were assuming that Dime Friend is not doing anything, they'd be correct. Or at least with that warrior. Anyway, gunship plants coming up. Probably going to see some banshees. Typical banshee or raider. Re There's warriors up. It'll be, rap it'll be rapier. It won't be banshees. At least it won't likely be banshees. Banshees wouldn't do much, I don't think. That's kind of a bad idea. I mean, it might still be banshees. I don't know. They're fast. It's just that riot units deal with them. Nice raiding, by the way. Hokomoko doing a great job just dodging away from this warrior. Now it's it's the end. But still, that's four metal per second that was taken out. For the cost of two bandits. And it's going to take a while to rebuild. There were no builders nearby. In fact, it looks like... No, never mind. There were none nearby to begin with. And Dying Friend with a counterattack on the Rockos. Well, actually, a couple Rockos and Warrior coming in. Another pair of Rockos and the Warriors hanging back. Possible... Why are they hanging back? It wouldn't be for a flank. The Rockos would do no good there. But also... Why would they be flanked that way? Hokomoko is north of them. Not to mention Hokomoko is north, and they have this Conjurer here, so they'd see something coming. And overall, Dimefront's kind of secured the southeast. Kind of. Not really, but kind of. And now, Shield Ball versus mid-game Cloakie Army. I think the mid-game Cloakie Army is going to win. I mean, Rockos do a really good job against Shields. The Warrior's going to be careful. Apparently, the Rockos are not careful. What the? That's second friendly fight. Wow! What did that Warrior do to you, Rocco? I mean, seriously, that, that was your teammate. Or your... I'm not exactly sure how this works. It's more like a hive mind, I guess. That was your hive mind mate. Wow. I don't even know. That warrior must have said something bad about you or the commander or something. Something you held dear. My goodness, that was vindictive. And now that the Rockos basically destroyed their escorts, well, one of them, the other one just died of natural causes, these bandits have a field day. That's basically it. Okay. The warriors to the western side of the map, however, having no treacherous Rockos behind them, or Rockos at all, that one's done a much better job getting rid of the bandits there. But yeah, Pokemoko secured the eastern side, and Dimefront secured the western side. Although Hokomoko taking the eastern side with Rockos in front now, not behind the Warriors, even though generally it makes sense to be behind the Warriors. Not for the Warriors, apparently. Sheesh. That level of friendly fire is not that common. Not that I've seen, anyway. I mean, friendly fire is a thing, yeah, but not like that. That was weird. Anyway, looks like we're going to be seeing Banshees. Oh, indeed. Okay, yeah, loads of Banshees. All right, I guess the Warriors are not considered a great enough threat. I don't personally agree with that. Warriors are basically the anti- Oh, not, okay, they're not the best anti-Banshee. I think Redbacks are probably the best one. Still, they're, they're a riot unit against a unit that tends to clump up in the air. I mean, there's a lot of other things to deal with, so I think that the Warriors are probably not going to end up doing a huge amount of damage. The Banshees can avoid them. The Banshees are fast. And the Warriors are not posted everywhere, so the Banshees actually have a lot of room to move around. They might even be able to kill the Commander. The Commander is the same level of threat with the machine gun and everything. But the Commander is also a higher value target, even losing several Banshees to kill it. That's four metal per second, that's not bad. I mean, the Commander's kind of out of the way, so as far as construction goes, there's no real loss. Dying Throne has basically left that idle. It's effectively dead already. Okay, Sprung pointing out that Warrior is actually better than Redback as the numbers grow. So Warrior scales better than Redback, Redback does better at lower numbers. That makes sense. Outlaw's best? Interesting. Okay. Apparently Outlaw's the best anti banshee Actually, I could see that. I could to- Actually, you know what? Yeah. The only downside is Outlaws don't deal a huge amount of damage. They slow things, though, which is a big deal, but yeah. The fact that they have a radial attack and the Banshees tend to surround the target around the top. Yeah, I could totally see that. 
That makes sense. Still, what Dying Fruit has without adding another factory is the Warrior, which isn't a bad choice. However, they did add a factory, a gunship factory, and they have the Tridents, which is not as effective, unfortunately. And actually, these Banshees are having a field day in the main base, while at the same time, Dirtbag's just distracting stuff over to the center. But the main base actually might be protected. Banshees dealt their damage and left. That's about it. Actually, the Banshees forced out of the way. Those Tridents doing a lot of work. A lot of good work, and the dirt bags shouldn't be too big of a problem. I mean, they're going down as a bit of a distraction more than anything. But yeah, the Banshees are going down. Hokomoko is actually falling behind a bit. Dying Fruit needs to build more energy, though. They lost a lot of solar plants, and what? Re oh, no, Hokomoko's throwing in the towel. I'm thinking Dying Fruit throwing in the towel. Dying Fruit just successfully deflected the Banshee attack. Pretty big one, too. But yeah, that was that. How much metal excess was there? 600 from Dying Throne, 150 from Hokomoko. Hokomoko's excess is still pretty low. Out of 13k. So yeah, not bad. The income was really close. This was a relatively close game. I think it really just came down to, let's see. Because there, there was some raiding going on here that was a bit more successful for Dying Throne. Hokomoko's big raid, though, it just didn't do that much damage. It got a, Okay, those two solar collectors I think I got rid of. That was about it. Not bad, but the Tridents were built up just in time. That was very clutch. I think if the Tridents hadn't been built, the Banshees had been sent like two minutes earlier, there wouldn't have been anything in the main base. All the Warriors would have been out. That actually would have been better timing. That might have won the game for Hokomoko. Really think it was a matter of timing. Like, Hokomoko had set things up pretty intelligently. They had a bunch of factories set up. And died for an actually with a backup Cloaky Bot factory in the southeast side of the map. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, for all they knew, they were about to lose their Cloaky Bot factory. So, good on them. I mean, it did look like it was going to go down. But yeah, Dimefriend is pretty much just able to get that little bit of a greater advantage. Still, though, it was very even. And a lot of good rating for Hokomoko. Hmm. Yeah, I guess it's just Shield Ball has had a bit of a hard time against the Rockos. I'm surprised there were no rogues, now that I think about it. I think there was a Felon or two, but there were no rogues. So the Warriors pretty much had no real threat. The Thugs aren't going to threaten them. Not meaningfully. So yeah, had Hokomoko built a few rogues, I think they would have gone a bit differently. I think the Warriors would have had a harder time. The, rogue, the Rockos are still the problem. That still would have been an issue. But with the Warriors down, Bandits... Okay, Bandit has a lot of... But still, even the thugs could have done damage. Or at least walked up, I think. No, I think you would need bandits. I'm pretty sure you'd need bandits. Yeah, bandit, rogue, thug against this composition seems a bit more intelligent. Like, why would you have the outlaw? There's no glaives coming around. See, so yeah, I think I think bandit, rogue, and thug would have been the composition to go here. Anyway. That was that game, so the next game and last game for tonight is going to be between Capricious and Dimefriend on Avalanche. So that'll be up in a couple... Wait a sec. Yes, that's right. That'll be up in a couple minutes, so stay tuned.